So I met my husband five years ago. We were playing Ultimate Frisbee, and we're part of this group that just kind of gathers in the park. One Saturday, he had sent me a message online asking if I wanted to go to coffee or something, and so then, yeah, that's how we got a relationship going from that point on. So when we first started looking for a home, we weren't sure what neighborhood we wanted to live in. We started looking at homes in North Aurora and really fell in love with the area. Everybody that I've met or encountered seems really nice as well. And there's also diversity within the neighborhood. I'll see different people, different ethnic backgrounds. I even have some neighbors who I can talk in Spanish with, which has been kind of cool. We started learning about Chapel Street Church when during the pandemic we saw some signs around people's lawns that were like, oh Chapel Street, you know, um, keep God close, everybody else should be six feet away. I thought that was a fun way to engage with the neighborhood as well as just seeing how many of our actual neighbors are attending this church. So my husband and I checked it out, started watching online, and then when the uh, campuses opened up again, we went to Mill Creek. We visited there one Sunday and we met Pastor Sterling and we told him, yeah, we're new, we're here from North Aurora. He goes, North Aurora? There's a campus opening in North Aurora this fall. And we're like, what? And so he's like, I'm going to have you meet Pastor Andrew, who also happened to be there that Sunday. So we got to meet him right away and he was telling us about the church and just got to share in the excitement of, wow, we could have a campus right by our home that we could walk to. We could be part of a launch, which is something we haven't done before and just get to see God develop and build a church campus near us. When the campus actually launched in September 2021, we were very excited and very ready to get involved. And it was very meaningful for, I would say, myself, my husband in particular, because now we started to meet the faces and the families associated with the signs that were in the lawns during the pandemic. It was a big piece of us feeling connected and excited about building a church. So being part of a neighborhood church in a neighborhood that I live in has been really meaningful because it creates a different level of concern for my neighborhood. I feel like I want my neighbors to know about Jesus, but I also want them to feel like they can have a place to come to and just not just turn to me as a neighbor, but also they know that they can turn to Chapel Street as a church. And my husband and I we really have a desire to help serve in the church. So wherever there is a need that presents itself, um, we like to just step up because we're in a time in our lives where we don't have children, um, we're right by the church, we work from home, and so we really have a lot of time and availability that we want to dedicate to serving the Lord. I've been a part of other churches before that have you know, a vision to expand, but when I understood Chapel Street's specific mission of being a neighborhood church and in the community, it's really neat to experience that and to see the impact that that can have because it's now a center point of the neighborhood. Since we've launched the North Aurora campus, uh, it's really been instrumental in getting me excited about you know, having a relationship with God and a relationship with others. And it's also raised a level of awareness and concern and um, passion for my community that I want my neighbors to know about this church. I want my neighbors to know Jesus. When I think about a year from now, five years from now, it's very exciting to consider all that God's going to do here in this neighborhood, all that He already has done. When you can reflect back already on His faithfulness and it's only been a year coming out of a pandemic, I mean, God's going to do so much more and we're so excited and we are here for it. You know, Rachel's story is, is so compelling. In fact, when we met as a preaching team and watched that video, we all remarked that she captures so well the neighborhood church vision, which is precisely what we want to talk to you about today. So welcome to those of you who are joining us online at our South Street campus. Uh, Rachel it articulates what it means to be part of the church, what it has always meant to be part of the church, and why uh, this church particularly was compelling to her. And we want to describe from the, God's Word, the New Testament, of what the church is and meant to be for us. Last week, we looked at what the church really is, and this week, we're going to look at what the church does or what the church looks like when it's living as it's supposed to live. I mentioned last week that my wife and I recently returned from a trip to England where we visited uh, the Cotswolds, the Rural District, and the Lake District. And one of the things that we love to do is visit churches, old country, village churches, ancient churches, cathedrals, all churches. I'm fascinated by the history, the architecture, and the story of God's work in that church. I'm going to show you an image here of a church called St. Edward's Church in Stowe-on-the-Wold. We walked there six miles each way, this little village called Stowe-in-the-Wold. And 
this church, St. Edward's, is over a thousand years old. In fact, the original structure dates to before 900 AD. This door here is called the Hobbit's Door. Can you guess why? Uh, it's said to be the inspiration for Tolkien's uh, Durin's door in his Lord of the Rings. If you've seen the movie, you know they sit outside the door to uh, Moria trying to figure out the password. The, these are ancient yew trees. The door itself is over 800 years old. The trees are at least that old, perhaps older. They're ancient yew trees uh, surrounding that door. Here's a picture of my wife and I at the door. So you can see it's not a very large door as we stand there. And those of you that are Tolkien fans, I myself am a self-professed Tolkien nerd. I love all things. That, and by the way, some of you might know this. Tolkien was a very good friend of none other than C.S. Lewis. I visited uh, Oxford where they would, used to meet. Uh, and this church is supposed to be the inspiration for Durin's Door, as I said. And I thought about that. You know, is it true? And I've done some research online. It's, it's hard to say. There is a pub nearby that was the inspiration for the Inn of the Prancing Pony in The Lord of the Rings. And I like to figure out historically, are these things accurate? And if you're a nerd like I am and you care about the original stories, then when somebody makes a movie or, or uh, depicts it in any way, you want that depiction to be faithful to the original story. It matters to you because the original story really matters. The author's intent matters. Now, maybe you're like, ah, I just watched the movies and I fell asleep. I don't really care that much. Whatever the case, I want to talk to you about what was the original story of the church? What's our story? When it comes to the story of the origins of God's people, the church, are we faithful to that story? John Dixon, in his book, Bullies and Saints, says that Jesus gave us a beautiful, uh, you know, composition, symphony, if you will, a song to play called the gospel. And we, his people, the church, have not always played it right. Sometimes we've been out of tune. Sometimes we've played an entirely different song. But every now and then throughout history, we have played it the way Jesus intended it, and it's beautiful, and it's good. And so we want to do that, go back and look at what's the intent? What is the church meant to be, to look like, to do in the world. Last week, we looked at what the church is. This week, what the church does. You remember last week, we looked at this passage from the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20, where he says, therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. An ambassador, meaning somebody who, who is a representative of a different nation or kingdom in another country. Like when you go visit a U.S. embassy, it's a little piece of U.S. soil in a different nation. That's what the church is meant to be. And God is making his appeal through us. That's a profound statement. I want you to think about that for a minute. God is making his appeal through us. Us, plural, all, all y'all, all of us, meaning, not just you individually. God is appealing to the world through his people. So let's ask the question, what does our appeal look like? How are we doing? How is God's appeal through us, his church? And are we faithful to what he originally intended his church to be? Now, I've said many times, and I'll say again, there's no such thing as a perfect church because people are in churches, and we inevitably get things wrong. And that was true from the very beginning. Read through the New Testament letters to churches. They're full of rebukes and corrections and warnings because from the very beginning, God's people were getting stuff wrong and needed to be realigned. Well, that's still true today. We should take some level of encouragement from that. Yet even with all of its flaws and its failures, the early church was the closest to the original story. A depiction, a little snapshot, if you will, of what God intended, and something we would do well to study and learn from. So we're gonna look at this little vignette from Acts chapter two, maybe the most famous little portrait of the church in action, what their community was really like and see what we can learn from it in our community today. Acts two, verses 42 through 47. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to the prayers. And awe came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. As I said, this may be among the most famous little vignettes 
uh, snapshots of what the church was like at its birth, at its inception. And we're going to study now some of those things. Scholars and historians debate the, the rise of the church. How did this little movement within Judaism rise to become something that would overthrow the Roman Empire, would turn upside down the Greco-Roman world in which it existed? How did that happen? And you could make the case that the key distinction among these Christians, these first believers and followers of Jesus, this first church, was in the very first couple of words. And they devoted themselves. That word devoted is crucial. In fact, if we go back to Acts 2, 42 for just a moment, and they were told, devoted themselves. If something is devoted, it's, it's given to, it's set apart for, it's set aside for someone or something. And so these first followers of Jesus gave themselves, set themselves apart for what? For him and for each other. It's their devotion, this radical giving of themselves away that was so distinctive. And the rest of the passage describes what that looked like, how that manifested itself in their lives together. So as we go through this passage, I want you to be thinking along these lines. This is our origin story. If you're a follower of Jesus, then you're a part of the church. And that means this is your story of origin. This is where you come from. Maybe in your family you tell stories of origin. You tell, you tell stories that kind of unite you as a family. Well, this is our story. This is what we're a part of as the, as the family of God. So six distinctives of the community of Jesus as we go through here. Six crucial distinctives of the community of Jesus right out of this passage. Six characteristics of their shared life together. Six things that shaped the way that they lived and that were compelling to the world around them. Number one, it was a learning community. A learning community. Not a stagnant community, not like once upon a time we believed this thing and now we just carry on with our lives, but a church committed to learning and to growing in their knowledge. Acts 2.42, once again. And they devoted themselves to what? To the apostles' teaching. This is crucial. One of the first things listed they were committed to was the teaching of the apostles. Well, what were the apostles teaching? What was their teaching? Well, they really only had one thing to teach. To teach. Remember, the apostles were Jewish believers in Jesus, converts to faith in Jesus as the Messiah. So they were teaching Jesus. They were teaching who Jesus was, what Jesus did, what his death and resurrection meant, and how it fulfilled all that they had been steeped in in the Old Testament scriptures. That's what they were teaching. Who is Jesus? What does his life, death, and resurrection really mean for our identity and for our mission in the world? That's what they were all about. They were devoted to this teaching, meaning this was a community under authority of teaching. They weren't just making it up as they went along. It wasn't just a pooling of their own opinions. It wasn't cultural whims of the day. They were under the authority of teaching. Here's how John Stott puts this. Since the teaching of the apostles has come down to us in its definitive form in the New Testament, then for us today to be devoted to the apostles' teaching means to be under the authority of the New Testament. That's precisely how we as the church today are devoted to the apostles' teaching, the apostolic teaching which has come down to us in the New Testament, which is the fulfillment of the Old Testament. We need the, the link there, and Jesus himself is that link. Second Peter 3.18 puts it this way, But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and, and to the day of eternity. Amen. But grow. In, in Greek means continually grow, keep growing in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This is a community co committed to wrestling with issues, struggling with truth, asking hard questions, but doing so through the lens of and under the authority of the Word of God. Don't you want a community that's a learning community? Don't you want to be part of a church that wrestles with truth and how it applies to life today? From its inception... That's what the people of God were committed to, a learning community. Second, a sharing community. A sharing community. Now, I remember when I was a little kid in Sunday school. I don't remember much from Sunday school, to be honest with you, but I remember getting in fight one time and, and getting in trouble and kicked out of Sunday school, which might surprise you as a pastor. And I remember Mrs. Kingston, my Sunday school teacher, saying to us, God is happy when we share. 
<laughs> well, he's, that's true, but that's not precisely what this is talking about. It's not just talking about sharing our possessions, although they certainly did that, and we'll talk about that later. It's talking about their shared life together. Acts 2, 42 through 44. They voted themselves the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship. This phrase in Greek is crucial, the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to pr the prayers. And all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together, this phrase together, and had all things in common. The two phrases circled here, the fellowship and in common, are from the same Greek word, koine. It means commonness. Koinonia, to have in common. Koine, maybe you've heard the phrase koine Greek, common Greek, meaning the common tongue or common language of the day. They had something in common that bound them together. What was that? Their shared life in Christ. That's why when you read through Paul's letters in the New Testament, the phrase in Christ shows up over and over and over again because he is what they have in common. Now, I want to remind you, this group that's sharing this life together, they're not all the same. They're not from the same culture. They're not from the same language. They're not even from the same ethnic background. We know that in this time, because of the Passover and Pentecost festivals, Jerusalem had swelled to three or four times its normal size. So when 3,000 people convert to faith in Jesus and join the church, they, have, they are visiting the city. They don't even speak the same language. They might all speak the common tongue, Greek, but it's not their native tongue. And so these people are coming together, and they, they have social differences. They have racial and ethnic differences. They have language and cultural differences. But what they have in common transcends all of those differences. Friends, this is always true about the church where it's healthiest, is that the things which would ordinarily divide us in society, political ideology, socioeconomic class or status, those things are transcended by our shared life in Christ, which holds us together, where otherwise we would, we would be pulled apart by the forces in our culture. I, I don't know about you, but we desperately need that today. I see so many in the church being pulled apart by the wrong forces because we're not aware of what's supposed to hold us together, and that is the life we have in Christ. So they had this shared community, all of the social, racial, and ethnic barriers. In fact, this was one of the distinctives that was so unique about them that compelled the Greco-Roman culture around them. Listen to what histor Yale historian uh, Kenneth Scott Latourette says about this. A history of the expansion of Christianity. More than any of its competitors, Christianity attracted all races and classes. Judaism never quite escaped its racial bonds. Christianity, however, glorified in its appeal to Jew and Gentile, Greek and barbarian. The Greco-Roman philosophies never really appealed to the masses, but were the domain of the social elites. Christianity drew the lowly and unlettered, and at the same time, won the minds of many of the highly educated. The point is, there was no other movement or religion in the ancient world which drew in so many different and uh, people from different races, ethnicities, education backgrounds, economic backgrounds, language backgrounds. It brought them together in Christ. And that was unique, different in the world, compelling to people. Maybe you've heard of Tom Holland's book, Dominion. I would recommend it to you. Or another book by a guy named Glenn Scrivener called The Air We Breathe. In both of these books, there's a con consistent theme, and that is many of the values that we hold dear today, such as care for the poor, you know, uh, the universal human rights and dignity, uh, forgiving our enemies, love as a, as a supreme ethic, the racial equality. All of these things were not common in the ancient world of the first century. In fact, they were unheard of until this movement of Jesus followers began to embody them because of their devotion to Jesus. We, we, we highlight these values, but we do not know where they come from. They come from the Judeo-Christian tradition. They come from the church. Love for the poor, love for enemies, racial and ethnic equality and diversity that matters, universal human rights. These things were not normal. In fact, when some of the first Christian missionaries in the church began to go into Europe, the, the barbarian tribes heard these things and thought, no society can survive if you're forgiving your enemies or, or if you're treating everybody the same. People in power have to hold things together. The church said, no, actually, Jesus holds things together and our faith is in him. So there was this sharing community. Number three, a praying community. The early church 
from its very inception, was a community of people committed to prayer. In fact, this is what they're doing when the Holy Spirit comes upon them at Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. Jesus said, wait, pray for the gift my Father will give you, the Spirit of God. Isn't this incredible? They're praying, the Spirit falls on them, and they begin to proclaim the wonders of God to the people of God. A praying community. Acts 2.42, once more. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to the prayers. You might read this and think, well, yeah, public prayer, praying in the, in the church service. Certainly that was true. But it means all of them. Prayer was a, sort of the air they breathe, the fabric of their, of their life together. In fact, we go back to Acts chapter 1, verse 14 for a minute. All these with one accord were devoting themselves to, to prayer. Devoting themselves to prayer. From the beginning. Together with the women, Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. This is before, so before the Spirit comes and falls on them, and after the Spirit comes and falls on them, prayer is central and essential to their life together. In Acts 1.8, Jesus tells his followers they will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon them to be his witnesses, and that power is accessed through prayer. One more passage from Acts chapter 4, verse 31. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken. They were filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. There is a connection, a direct link between their prayer, the Spirit's power, and their sharing of their faith. This is a community committed to prayer. Now, as, as a pastor here at Chapel Street, I think about this often. All of our planning, all of our programming is of is of no use, really, if it isn't undergirded and surrounded and upheld by prayer. And I confess that we have a lot of growing to do in this. I do, personally. If I'm honest, I'm still learning and growing about the power of prayer in the church. And so are we as a community. And when I read this passage, I'm, I'm reminded, all of our wisdom and strength and ideas and, and, uh, and you know, strategies, they're, they're, all, they're okay as far as they go. But if you compare all of that with the power of prayer, there's no comparison. There's just no comparison. And I think what God wants is for us to bring those things together. Our prayer, his power, infusing our plans and our programs and our strategies. A praying church is a community that's not just relying on its own wisdom and its own strength. May that be true of us as a church. Number four, a serving community. The people of God, where they're healthiest, have always been a community giving themselves away in service to others. Selfless sacrifice and service is, is the way of Jesus. And by the way, we're going to launch into a series beginning next week called The Way, looking at the specific distinctives of what it means to follow him. And one of them, of course, will be service. Acts 2, verse 45 puts it this way. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. Now, some people have taken this passage and others like it in Acts and lifted them out of context and said, see, the Bible supports social communi or political communism. Well, not exactly, because they all had possessions, but they didn't see their possessions as their own. Uh, this is crucial. Look at Acts 44, verses 32 to 35. Now, the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any of the, the things that belonged to him was his own. But they had everything in common. There's that same word, koine again. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and a great grace was upon them all. So they had private possessions. They just didn't think of them or see them as mine. So it isn't political communism. It's a spiritual communalism that's prevalent in this community. I mean, they saw their very lives and all their stuff as not their own possession, but as ultimately coming from God and belonging to their brothers and sisters. So they freely gave as any had need. And this again stood out in the world, in the ancient world. Nobody was doing this. In fact, there's a letter uh, to Emperor Julian from some of his uh, opponents of Christianity in the first century, or third century, excuse me, who were saying these Christians put us to shame because they care not only for their own poor, but for ours as well. They were radically generous. Timothy Keller puts it this way, the early Christians were totally opposite from their culture in this distinct way. They were radically generous with their wealth and possessions and radically stingy with their bodies sexually. 
and the Greco-Roman culture was exactly the opposite. Promiscuous with their bodies, but stingy with their stuff. As people of God, we should be the opposite of that. Generous, because it's not mine, it's his. And that's what he's called us to do, a serving community. Number five, a worshiping community. A worshiping community. Now, we are examining and focusing on uh, the distinctives of this community for good reason. We want to learn from them. We want to emulate them. We want to incorporate these things into our community of faith. But you know what's interesting? This community, they were not focused on their distinctives. They were focused on the distinctiveness of Jesus and on his glory. And that's what worship really is. It's not just singing songs. It's your whole life being devoted to the, 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 the absolute uniqueness praiseworthiness, glory of one person, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what it means to be a worshiping community. Acts 247, once, uh, the, the last portion here. Praising God and having favor with all the people. The Lord added their number day by day, those who are being saved. Like it sort of encapsulates their life, right? They're committed to teaching and to prayer and to service and to shared life. And they're praising God all the time. And sometimes you can read that and think, does this mean they're just constantly singing? No, once again, they're praising God with their very lives. And sometimes that means breaking out in a song when they come together to sing songs and hymns and spiritual songs. But also just their life was a life of praise. And this is crucial for the church. Psalm 22, verse 3. Some of you might know this song. It won't be on the screen, but I'll just quote it for you. You are holy and you are enthroned in the praises of Israel. The old King James translates it, God inhabits the praises of his people Israel. The, the Hebrew word there is yeshab. It means enthroned, to sit upon, to dwell in, to inhabit. Now, God is omnipresent. He's not only present in the praises of his people, but I think what we see in the Acts 2 community, that's a, a reality of, the, of Psalm 22, is that God is especially present in the praises of his people. We feel his presence. This is why it says earlier in the passage, then awe came upon every soul, a sense of awe and wonder. Have, have you had that experience? Maybe, maybe gather together other believers, lifting your voice in song. I've had that experience many times in the mountains of Ecuador, in, in, in Russia with a church. I didn't even speak the language. Moments of awe and wonder where I'm, I, I tangibly feel the presence of God and the power of God in the room. That's what, that's what they're talking about. Now, that doesn't happen every time, but consistently praising him and having a sense of awe and wonder that God is here. God is in the midst of our worship. God is present with us. That marks the early church and ought to mark the church everywhere that it's found. Number six and last, a witnessing community. A witnessing community. Let me put it to you this way. A church devoted to Jesus is a church devoted to telling other people about him. You can't be his church and keep that message private. From its beginning, the community of Jesus in the world has been passionate about his teaching, shared life, service, worship, prayer, of course, and letting the world know that Jesus is king, that his grace is available, that forgiveness is for you, that his love and mercy are available to you. For all people, from all walks of life, from every corner of the world, that's the mission of the church. When Jesus says in Acts 1.8, you will be my witnesses, what does he mean? He just doesn't mean my examples, like live your life and hopefully people will get the idea. He means live this life and tell people about me. The church has always been doing that. Once again, Acts 2, 42 through 47. Praising God, having favor with all the people. This phrase, favor, is the Greek word charis. It means grace. It means the, the grace of God is upon them. It means people saw in their life the grace of God, and because of that, they had favor. Does the church have favor in the world today? Well, it depends what part of the world you're talking about and who you ask. To the degree that I think that we're living on mission for Christ, we will. Not perfectly, not always. Sometimes there'll be opposition. And then it says this, and, oops, go back one there, verse 47, and the Lord added to their number, day by day, those who are being saved. 
John Stott says something interesting about this. He says, God does not save people uh, without bringing them into the church. And he does not bring them into the church without saving them. Now, you can attend a church service and not be saved. But what he's saying is, when you are saved, when you receive, when you repent of your sin and receive grace by faith in Jesus Christ, you are by definition brought into his family. There's no such thing as individualistic Christianity. God does not save apart from his church, and he does not bring you into the church apart from salvation. Those things go together is what he's saying. We need that. Now I want to ask you this question. Who adds to their number? Who is it that adds to their number? The Lord. The Lord adds to their number. You and I don't save anybody. But you and I can share about the love and mercy of Jesus Christ and trust him to do the work. Pastor Brian recently returned from Nepal where he was telling us at our preaching team meeting just this past Thursday stories about people in Nepal sharing consistently their faith. And it takes up to 100 personal witnessings, sharings, for one conversion. And they track this, and they're passionate about it. And they don't get discouraged because they know that it belongs to the Lord. And people in Nepal are coming to faith in Jesus Christ. You don't see it on your Facebook feed. You don't read about it in the news. You don't see it on TV. But it's happening around the world today. The church, where it's healthiest, has always been a church that's bearing witness to the power of Jesus Christ. A couple more passages here, Acts 4, 31 and 33. And when they had prayed, notice the connection between their prayer, the place where they were gathered together was shaken, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. You see the progression? Their prayer, the power of the Spirit, and bold witness going together. And then Acts 5, verse 42. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that Christ, that the Christ is Jesus, meaning Jesus is the Messiah. I like this phrase, and from house to house, house to house, street to street, in our language, neighborhood to neighborhood, this sounds like the neighborhood church vision. Life by life, house to house, street to street, neighborhood by neighborhood, community by community, we're impacting the world for the sake of Jesus Christ. We must be. We're called to be. Doesn't, doesn't all of this sound like the kind of church you want to be part of? Doesn't it sound like the church you've always wanted? A church committed to, the, to wrestling with truth and applying it to our lives. A church with shared life uh, and grace. A church committed to prayer, bathed in prayer. A church that's radically serving the poor inside of our family and outside of our family. And a church that's worshiping Jesus. We're not about ourselves, we're about his glory. And a church that's boldly witnessing to who he is. It's a church I want to be a part of. Would you also admit with me that when you think about your church experience, there's a gap between what we experience in church and what God intended? Why don't we experience this level? Why don't we always? And I, and I love our church. I think in many ways, I think about these six things, God is growing us and we are uh, on mission, but, but we're not perfect. There is no perfect church. And there are gaps. So why don't we experience this more? I think the reason goes back to the, that first couple of words in Acts chapter 2, verse 42. And they devoted themselves. You know, friends, I think we have the kind of church that we personally are devoted to. You could say we have the kind of church that we actually want. I mean, the, the kind of church that we're giving ourselves to. And I think it's worthwhile, each of us, doing a little internal examination, evaluation of our own hearts. How, how is my level of devotion to the Word of God, to the teaching of Jesus? Am I committed or am I picking and choosing? Am I committed, am I devoted to the shared life of the fellowship of believers? Or is it just when it's convenient for me? Am I committed to a life of prayer for others, for the church, for the witness of God in the world? Am I committed to service, to giving myself and my resources away for the sake of God? Am I committed, am I devoted to worship and to witness? If we go right down the list, I have some growing to do. Maybe you do as well. We do as a church. But here's the last thing. This is not a guilt trip, like go be more devoted. The reason these early followers of Jesus were so devoted to Christ and to each other is because they were 100% convinced that Jesus was devoted to them. He gave his life. He went to the cross. He shed his blood. He died. Why? 
out of his devotion to the Father and to his bride, the church. Ephesians 5, right? Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. That is our motivation for our devotion. The degree to which you know how much Christ loves you, how much he gave for you, how committed he is to you, will have direct impact on the degree to which you are devoted to his mission in the world called the church. As I said, we've got a lot of growing to do, but I, for one, get excited about returning to our roots, seeing how this picture of the church can manifest itself in our day, in our church, and in the world. Let's pray. God, we thank you. We thank you for Rachel's words in the video that started this, where she said, I want my neighbors to know about Jesus. We thank you that your vision for the church is a compelling vision because it flows right out of your heart and love. And we confess that we fall short and there are gaps and we don't always commit ourselves to that. But in this moment, Lord, we want to devote ourselves to you and to each other for your sake and glory. We pray in your name. Amen.